Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. This is uh, Dr. William Clark, Pastor of Living Faith Church. So glad to be with you for another Bible study. Uh, this is our time to get together and to study the Word of the Lord and to spend time in discussing His Word. God has been faithful and good to us. This is another Wisdom Wednesday opportunity for us to come together. I'm glad that we have this opportunity to come together, and I'm glad that we can focus on the Word of the Lord today together. And as we jump into this word, I want you to begin to think about how good God has been to you. And I know that there are there's a temptation to complain. I know that there's a temptation to focus on what you don't like and focus on what you don't have. But would you focus on the fact that God has been good, ha that he has been faithful, that he has been consistent, that he's been there for you, that he's been uh, positioned by, by your side, not only walking beside you, but leading you uh, from every point for, uh, since the last time you sought him in prayer. Now, for some of you, that's been a long time. For some of you, that was just this morning or a few moments ago. But regardless of the last time you sought God in prayer, he's been with you. He's been beside you. He's been around you. He's been leading you. He's been beneath you. He's been above you. He is always there, always present. And because of that, we thank him. So let's pray for a moment. And let's begin to invite the Lord into our space. Father, we bless your name for your loving kindness, your greatness towards us. We thank you for how you've been blessed towards us. You've been consistent towards us. You've been faithful towards us. We don't deserve what you've done. We don't deserve your goodness and your mercy and your faithfulness towards us. But we say thank you. We thank you for another Wednesday. We thank you for another opportunity to study your word and to be in the presence of your people. Father, albeit in a virtual environment, we are still thankful. Albeit on the phone, we're still thankful. Albeit through streaming mechanisms, we are still thankful. So, Father, would you be with us today? Give us a word that will empower us to get over this hump day and bless us to live in a powered rest of the week. We say this and we pray this in the master's name of Jesus. Let the people of God say amen. So we're going to continue in our series, Wisdom is Better Than... And uh, we've been talking about a number of things, but today we're going to talk about wisdom is better than the setup. We're going to be coming out of Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse, uh, let's see here. We're going to focus on verse 8 and verse 9. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 8, verse 9. And here's what the word of the Lord says. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. Uh, he, verse 9, he who quarries stones is hurt by them. And he who splits logs is endangered by them. This is an interesting uh, description that Solomon provides to us. And I think it helps us uh, understand our topic today, which is wisdom is better than a setup. One of the things that we have to be mindful of is that when we are engaging in behavior that attempts to get back at people or attempts to harm people, we are, in fact, putting ourselves in danger. We are, in fact, putting ourselves in a position where we, I, we might be harmed by our own activity and our own uh, behavior that, uh, uh, that I don't think many of us notice. I don't think many of us notice that when we're trying to harm other folks, when we're trying to be responsive to the hurt that we feel, when we're trying to uh, let people know by way of the get back that they hurt us, the effort we put into getting back at people, the effort we put into harming people, uh, in fact, has this ripple effect that hurts us back, that, that harms us back. And in the midst of the get back, in the midst of the setup, in the midst of trying to make a point to people who may not even notice that they hurt us, we actually spend so much energy – Focused on the pain, the specific pain and the specific hurt and the specific uh, thing we're going to inflict upon them that we don't even notice the kickback of what's happening in the moment to us. Think about this. When you're at the gun range and you're shooting a gun, uh, if you're not prepared, the kickback of the gun can knock you off your rocker. It can cause you to become unstable. It can cause you to lose your footing. Especially when you start to use a gun of a higher caliber, a higher weight that shoots a lot more power. If you're not positioned correctly, if your shoulder is not properly positioned to, to deal with the kickback of the gun, if your feet are not positioned well, if the weight of your body is not positioned well, the kickback can knock you off your feet and put yourself in danger because you're going to fall. But also put yourself and others in danger because the gun may go off more uh, as you're falling to the ground trying to maintain safety. With that analogy in mind, this is what Solomon is setting us up with in terms of our understanding today, understanding today in terms of wisdom is better than a setup. And that is 
when we're trying to inflict pain or uh, inflict a massive the ma- the maximum amount of danger upon people, there's this kickback that we're not paying attention to, that has a way of coming back to us. It has a way of harming us. And and the, the interesting thing about even just establishing this concept in this Bible study is that we just we just don't consider it. We we just don't consider the repercussions of trying to inflict pain upon others and how it can come back. There's a selfishness that comes with being in pain because when pain rushes in, we focus on the hurt area, which is likely on our person. And the hurt area on our person receives the attention as long as it needs to ensure, one, that we are here for you or that body part that's in pain. We will nurse it back to health. And then two, the overall body, all of its biological functions rush to that particular part of the body to let it know, listen, all all energy, all blood flow, anything you need will be sent to that part of the body, adrenaline. To ensure that, one, we got your back, and then number two, that you get every ounce of our regenerative, regenerative regenerating uh, functions, rather, so that you can heal, so that you can feel better. It's, it's very selfish. It's, it's very self-centered. It's, very, it's, it's a self-contained experience, if you will. And because of that self-contained experience... It is an interesting experience to go through pain, particularly if it's inflicted by another person. And more specifically, if it's inflicted by someone you care about and who cares about you. So the pain comes, the hurt comes, the disappointment comes, and it hurts the heart, hurts the soul, hurts the spirit, hurts the mind then in turn hurts the body and you become super focused on the pain you feel in that moment and rightfully so right you know the pain is is unbearable the pain is clearly capturing all the attention that it deserves now as we deal with this pain and as we deal with whatever is happening in this moment with the pain we're also reminded of, or at least we start to think about, why? Why is this happening to me? Why is this something that I have to deal with? Why is this a part of my experience? Why do I have to experience this? Why do I have to sit through this and deal with this? And the interesting thing about that thought process is it leads to the person who is the perpetrator of the pain. So we believe. And as we start the process, okay, this person harmed me. This person did this. This person said this. This person uh, maneuvered against me this way. As we start the process, that then we start to see this person or the perpetrator or at least the carrier of this painful experience as the, the source of why we're going through what we're going through. And as a result of trying to heal self, heal the soul, heal the mind, heal the body, heal the heart, we are also looking to attack the thing that caused harm and that thing happens to be another person this brings us to our text because what solomon is trying to help us understand is the setup or the get back that we feel is justified oftentimes results in pain that is not inflicted upon another person but it is actually inflicted upon self therefore causing deeper pain yet again. One of the things we talked about on Sunday, this past Sunday sermon, was it is difficult to replicate pain that you went through years ago in an effort to uh, pass that pain on to the person who you believe perpetrated you. The circumstances that that surrounded the pain you went through, the, the environment, the reason, the timing – of it all is it's very hard to replicate that if not impossible therefore if you are remotely successful at inflicting similar pain upon the perpetrator of uh, the worst moment of your life 
It might not be received the same way that you received the pain way back when. The circumstances are different. People are different. Timing is different. But what ends up happening when you're trying to hurt someone that hurt you is that you end up being hurt yet more because even when you get back at that person, according to you, you then realize that what? Why did I do that? What was the purpose of that? Or there isn't or wasn't much satisfaction in the get back as I thought there would be. Because the person doesn't feel my pain. The person doesn't see the world the way that I do. The person doesn't feel the emotions I feel. The person doesn't have the same world view that I have. They don't have the same belief system that I have. So therefore, the pain that I'm trying to inflict upon them will never register because their pain tolerance their pain threshold is much different than mine. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 8 here, when he says, He who digs a pit will fall into it. You're so busy digging a pit, digging, uh, setting, some, setting someone up, trying to harm someone. You're so busy trying to uh, endanger someone that in the effort of building this ditch, this, this pit for this person, you don't realize how much danger you're in because of the effort you're building, uh, putting into building this pit. You're not looking at the danger around you because you're unsettling your foundation. You're not looking at the fact that you did not cross every I, a T and dot every I as it relates to the digging process. You haven't taken into account the weather, the environment traffic and all these other things and it, it is so emblematic of if you ever watch these any movie that has a plot to it uh, or this this dramatic plot to it where uh the bad guy is always leading the movie off you know he's hurt he's harmed by this experience then about 80 to 90 percent of the movie is the bad guy trying to get back at the good guys the so-called good guys and as they are busy digging ditches trying to harm the good guys they don't realize that every step of the way that they've taken to harm the good guys actually has been a deeper setup to harm themselves. And when the movie concludes, you realize or the, the watcher realizes that what they meant for evil for the good guy actually was meant for themselves. They harmed themselves. And Solomon is saying this in verse 8, he who digs a pit will fall into it. The, the idea that you're trying to get back at people is indicative of pain you feel, not only from uh, the experience that that person took you through or the experience you have with that person, but it's also indicative of a brokenness between you and God. A brokenness that says God's flow, as we talked about on Sunday, the flow of his breath the flow of his wind, the flow of his spirit within us has been disrupted or limited because of an experience we have that we can't get over. And this is not to say that the experience you had or are having is insignificant. No, 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 no. The, the, what, you, what people mean for evil, God means it for good. So, yeah, it, what you feel is legit. What you're going through is legit. But what, what we have to be thoughtful of and mindful of is the setup does not help us reclaim the peace that has been temporarily disrupted. The setup or the get back to our enemy does not recover the joy that has been temporarily stolen. The setup or the get back with and to our enemy doesn't allow us to recover the love that has been put on pause. Therefore, the effort you're putting into digging dishes, the effort you're putting into trying to harm other people, the effort you're putting into trying to set other people up actually doesn't recover or bring back anything that you think you've lost. The way you bring back lost peace, lost joy, lost love is by, in fact, figuring out a way to move past this pain and hurt. OK, now, now, some of you may need therapy to process that. And if that's what you need, then go ahead and get that type of help for your mental health. But but think about this from a spiritual standpoint. 
the Bible is clear that vengeance belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to you. The effort you put in trying to get back at people is actually you trying to take over the role and the job of God. From a spiritual standpoint, your effort in digging a ditch, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 8, is you actually trying to take over for God and trying to do his job. When you're trying to do the job of someone else and when you're out of your lane, when you're no longer doing the things that you are called to do, capable of doing, you start to incur unnecessary stress. On the job, you're doing other people's job. You're incurring stress. Within your marriage, you're doing the job of your spouse, you're incurring stress. Within friendships, you're taking way too much of the load in the friendship, you're incurring stress. When stress is leveraged on your side of the fence and you're doing it because somebody else has dropped the ball, you are incurring stress. In the spiritual realm, when you attempt to do the work of God, do the job of God, trying to get back at people as if you're God and as if you have a place to put people in heaven or hell, you are incurring unnecessary stress. You're out of your lane. You're out of your league. You're doing way too much. And from a spiritual standpoint, in order to regain peace, love, joy, or whatever was stolen from you, you cannot... And hear me good. You cannot try to take the place of God to exact vengeance. This does not mean that you don't share your truth. This does not mean that you don't convey what happened to you and what your experience has been at the hands of someone who did you wrong or who did you dirty. But what this does mean is that you by yourself as a lone individual, as a lone spiritual being, you cannot try to. Exact revenge on your enemy. That's not how that works. There's the issue of trying to be God. There's the other issue of God's grace extended to your enemy in a way that you might not agree with. There's the issue of you and your healing further risking further damage to your soul if you try to do something that is God-like when it's not really your job to do. Risking further damage to your, your mental health and your emotional health. It's not worth it. And so this is why Solomon is warning us when we're talking about wisdom is better than. He who digs a ditch or digs a pit will fall into it. So instead of putting energy in getting back uh, at people who, are, who have hurt you, how about we spend our time? How about we focus our energy on focusing on our own healing and redemption? Your enemies, if they don't change their wicked ways, will receive their reward. Trust that. That is a part of the inner workings of God that we can't understand. We don't know when, where, or how. You got to trust that. And if you're able to trust that your enemies will receive their reward for whatever they've done, then you're also saying, I'm trusting God to be God. And I'm not going to step in the lane of God. I'm going to let him be who he is. Look at the B clause of verse 8. And a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. Yeah. The, the barrier that's set up for you that's trying to prevent you from overstepping your boundaries. He is saying that, listen, if you are in fact going to break through the boundaries that have been set up to prevent you from trying to be like God, or you're going to try to break through the barriers, barriers that are trying to prevent you from doing something that you will regret, there is something that's going to bite you on the other side. Because you don't see what's on the other side. This is the crazy part that we have to embrace about not being God. We don't see how God is moving in this whole ecosystem called life. We don't see how God is maneuvering around this whole ecosystem we call life. We don't understand how God is moving. We don't, we don't have a sense of the broader movement of God. And because we don't have a broader global um, celestial 
heavenly view of all that's happening, then we don't know what's on the other side if we decide to step over the boundaries and try to be like God. Therefore, risking harm, more harm than we initially intended or we initially went through. It's not healthy. It's not healthy. It's not healthy. It's not healthy to dig ditches. It's not healthy to try to set up folks. It's not healthy to try to harm folks. It's not healthy trying to get back at people. I get it. 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 You feel the pain. You feel the hurt. You, I get it. You, you feel you feel like vengeance is all up in you. And I get it. At, at work, they're talking about you. I get it. At work, they're trying to set you up. I get it. At work, they're trying to stand in the way of your promotion. I get it. Your ex is trying to harm you, emotionally break you. I, I get it. Your parents are no longer on your side. I get it. Friends have left you alone. But the, the thing about going through all that, the thing about the experience of that type of pain, that type of hurt, is people do this to get a rise out of you. And, 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 people do this to prove themselves right. See, if they get you to respond in a way that is ungodly, non-Christian, non-spiritual, then they have all of the ammo to say, see, I told you. See, I, I told you that they didn't have it together. I told you that they can't keep themselves focused. I See, I told you that they don't know how to... Uh, be mature. I, I See, I told you that they're not ready for this next level. And this is why Solomon is warning us. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and the serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. Here's the other side on verse 9. He who quarries stone is hurt by them. See, you're chipping. When you chip at stones and you quarry stones, you, you, you're trying to get stones out uh, of, of an fixed, from a fixed place. Uh, the more you are able to loosen stones for the purposes that you're des that you're trying to get out of them, uh, what what ends up happening are the little chips, the little pieces that start to nick at the skin, the the pieces, the small pieces of stone that start to uh, fly into the eye or get into your hair or they get into your skin or they get under your nails. The little you know those little pieces, the little pieces that you're not paying attention to because the the bigger pieces is what you're after. You're after the beautiful pieces that will be used for all types of decorative uh, things uh, but you're not paying attention to the little chips that will start to cut the skin and you go home after a full day's work with arm cuts all up and down your arm and you don't know why you got little cuts all over the face and you don't know why it's because the more you chip at the more you chip at a quarry, the more you try to chip at trying to get back, the more you try to chip at setting people up the more you try to chip at trying to hurt people in return in return for what they've done to you, while you may be seeing progress, big progress, what you're not noticing are a thousand cuts on your faces and your arms. Remember the movie. I love action movies. The bad guy always seems to be winning for 90% of the movie. And what he doesn't realize, every little step he makes to harm the good guys, these little chips, these little cuts, they're leaving clues for the good guys to come and get them. They're leaving clues for the good guys to come and, and follow up and to finally bring resolution to this issue once and for all. It, it, and then I also also in leaving clues, it, it, the, the bad guy, he's getting cut up. He's getting cut up. Scrape by scrape by scrape by scrape. Death by a thousand cuts. And while he was able to cut off large pieces from the quarry, if you will, he didn't even have a chance to use it all the way he intended which is amazing. After all of that effort, after everything he's done, he can't even use what he chipped away. Solomon says, he who quarries stone is hurt by them. He's so busy trying to get back at folks, man. Is it, is it really worth it? Is it really worth it? He says, in the B clause of that, and he who splits logs is a danger by them. Listen, one of my phobias is, uh, uh, is getting um, splinters. When I was a kid, you know, there were a couple things that happened to me that just kind of just get me a little antsy. Uh, one was a swallow, swallowing a fish bone uh, during a church dinner when I was a kid. And uh, just I've, you, I see fish bones 
yeah, there's extra caution there. The other thing is getting splinters. I remember uh, getting splinters as a kid, and as a kid, you know, you're just playing and you're doing your thing, and you don't even pay attention coming down the steps or touching the thing that has wood on it, and you just touch something like you regularly do, and boom, the, the, the little splinter goes in. And so the other day, uh, my wife asked me to pick up uh, some some wood uh, so that we can work on this project at our house. And uh, I am that guy at the Home Depot that did not want to help the staff member pick up this large piece of wood so he can cut it for me. Not, no. Because I don't want to get splinters. And when I did pick it up, there was this extra precaution. Uh, so he, he cut the pieces of wood up. And as soon as I got to the car, the first thing I did was I pulled out these gloves that I have. And I, I didn't even think about it before I went to the store. I just happened to have these rubberized, thick rubber gloves uh, that, that I use for other purposes. Had them in my car. I was like, oh, great, man. So I was able to grip with confidence this wood, these multiple pieces of wood, because my hands were protected. And so because of that, I was able to grip it with confidence, got to the house. I was able to unload the car with confidence. I'm walking around like a like He-Man uh, with these wood pieces, but I was able to have confidence because I knew that there was no way that there was going to be a splinter going through my thick gloves. And what Solomon says, what we don't notice, again, just like the quarry, you're so busy chopping wood, chopping wood, chopping wood, chopping wood, splitting logs, trying to set things up, trying to set somebody up, trying to put them in harm's way, trying to harm them. And what you don't know is that the little wood chips, the splinters are just getting caught in your skin. If you ever had a splinter get caught in your skin and it gets too deep where you can't pull it out by your own fingernail, it becomes very difficult. There was one time I was at this uh, this camp with these uh, young people from our church. And I was having a riveting time, if you will, playing this game. It's called carpet ball, something like that, where you got to be able to knock out somebody else's balls. And it was on a piece of carpet uh, inside this long wooden thing. And I was really into it, and I caught a splinter. And this is me as an adult. And, you know, I was like, oh, man, I've got to get this thing out. And it was so deep that I couldn't get it out. Now, what ended up happening, because we were at this camp several days, because we couldn't get it out, even with tweezers, uh, the, the person, the camp counselor said, well, you got to let it grow out. And what the person meant was, uh, I got to let the skin regenerate underneath the splinter so that it can slowly but surely push it out. And surely, uh, over the past couple of days, it was able to come out slowly but surely. And what we don't know, while we're trying to do something, we're having a good time trying to get back at folks, we're so focused on the revenge, we're so focused on the pain, we're so blinded by the anger, we don't notice the various splinters that are coming into us, harming us, making it worse. And we keep telling ourselves, well, I know I'm being chipped in the eye by the quarries. I know that I'm being, I have splinters all over my, my face and my arms uh, by uh, splitting these logs. But it'll be worth it if I can just drop this stone on their head, if I can just put this log in their way and stand in the way of their progress. We think it's worth it. And at the end of the day, just like in the movies, it doesn't turn out that way. The best biblical example of how the movies turn out is if you read the story of Jonah. Jonah was on a mission to tell Nineveh, God is going to get you for what you've done, the sin you've committed, the things you've done. God is about to burn you. And Nineveh caught wind, heard the prophet of God speak, and they did something that is available to all of us. They repented. And God heard their repentance, saw the sincerity of their heart, and God averted fire and fury. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me up in here. God decided to hold back and cancel the barrage that was destined for Nineveh. Now, Jonah is upset because he believes God is, he should follow through on his word. He said that he's going to do this. And what happened? What are you doing, God? And God says, listen, man, you ain't me. <laughs> you do, you try to, you're so busy doing my job. Your job was to prophesy. You were so busy worrying about some other stuff that you tried to avoid doing your job. You got on a ship, endangered other people, as opposed to saying and exp expressing the word of the Lord. We got to pause on this Jonah mentality. We so busy running away. We so busy uh, wanting to be the prophet and judge that we don't even see the bigger picture that God is a gracious God. He's a just God. He's a kind God. He is a forgiving God. He forgave you and all the craziness. That you've done. He forgave me in all my craziness. And here we are when we look at people who've harmed us. We are quick to say, God, get them. 
Jesus taught a lesson about this. We're so busy trying to get our debts forgiven, but we can't forgive the debts of other people. We're crazy. Wisdom is better than this setup. There is no wisdom in trying to set up folk. You don't know what God is trying to do in someone's life. Let me just close this. I can go on this forever. What people meant for evil, Joseph said, God meant it for good. And because of what you've been through, you are where you are right now. So if for nothing else, you need to thank your enemy for rejecting you, for telling you no, for hurting you, for harming you, for talking about you, for pushing you out. You should thank your enemy for being a part of your growth process. You should send them a love gift, a tithe, if you will. Because if it wasn't for their harm, you wouldn't have been pushed out. And you would not have stepped out on faith if it wasn't for the harm. On the other side, the guilt people feel after they realize that they harmed you sometimes can be catastrophic, fatal. And God, again, steps in and shows grace. Can we just acknowledge that God is in control of it all? Can we acknowledge that there is no wisdom in the setup? Can we acknowledge this? Can we Start the spiritual process and moving on. If you need mental support, mental health to help you process this mentally as you're processing this spiritually, would you go get the help you need? There's no shame in that. You come to Bible study every week. You come to church every week to get a word to help your spirit heal and to tap back into the spirit and the presence of God. Would you go ahead and do that with your mental health as well? I'm here every week to minister to your soul, to help you by the grace of God and through the word of God. Wisdom is better than this setup. It sure is. And for those of you watching and streaming on Facebook, if you want to continue this conversation with us, would you just go ahead and look at the phone number below? Call on in. Join the conversation through Zoom or call in, and we are going to continue this conversation. We're going to have a conversation about this. We're going to talk about this. We're going to explore this even more with our church members. If you want to be a part of this, just log off as soon as this broadcast is over. Call in. We'll be on there live. Continuing this conversation. Wisdom is better than a setup. I'm praying for you guys. See you guys this Sunday. And for those of you who are staying for the let out, we will continue this conversation. Just go ahead and click the link below or call in using the number below. God bless you.